Great. Today's webinar is brought to you by Clavis Insight uh, with our guest speaker, Ollie Bradley. He is the Global E-Commerce Experience Design Director at Unilever. Unilever has been working with Clavis since 2012 and the company uses our e-commerce intelligence solution in more than 20 countries to support its online channel programs. Ollie is going to be talking today about fast growing, the fast growing mobile channel and the strategies and tactics that Unilever employs to ensure its brands stand out on the small screen. In particular about mobile ready hero images, uh, a set of standards and practices that the company has developed around product images for the mobile channel. And I think it's very timely. I was just reading a, an article in uh, Business Insider UK a couple of weeks ago citing numbers from Capgemini and IMRG which uh, point to a staggering 47% increase in the uh, volume of e-commerce sales via smartphones and mobiles uh, during 2016 over uh, 2015. Um, so we could move on the slide, please. Um, we're very, really pleased to have Ollie with us here today. Um, as you'll have guessed from his job title, Ollie leads experience design in Unilever's global e-commerce team. He'll admit to being a bit of an e-commerce geek, but most of all, he's passionate about making shopping for Unilever products better online. Through his work with Cambridge University, Ollie and his team have come up with the concept of mobile-ready hero images. These images have delivered stronger conversion than standard images across all screen sizes uh, and are now live uh, with over 40 retailers in something like 20 markets around the world. Unilever has open sourced the design of these images in a bid to make online shopping better across the board. And Ollie is going to take you through how the images work and are already impacting Unilever's online business. Over to you, Ollie. Hey, thank you, Tom. Uh, that was a great introduction. I'm uh, really delighted, amped, revved up, I don't know what to say, excited to be given the opportunity to present on a, on a topic that I'm hugely passionate about. Um, I can't contain my enthusiasm sometimes on this. I think um, for me it's about making the shopper experience for consumers better on mobile and also simply for those like me with less than perfect eyesight. Uh, I think when you turn 40, uh, you realize that your eyes are not as good as <laughs> and you thought they were and multi-screening in the evening watching TV and looking at your smartphone is not as simple as it used to be when you were younger. <clears throat> but before I kick off, I, I, I love this cartoon because I think uh, it captures what happens a lot when uh, mobile gets desktop hand-me-downs, the shopper gets a bum deal. And um, I'd like to kind of start with a few personal examples of how pervasive smartphone usages and I will bet for most of us on the call today we are now doing as, at least as much email on our smartphones between meetings and possibly in the evening sadly than on our laptops uh, outside of meetings and one of the things that I've realized is if I know I'm sending an email to a very senior person in Unilever I will ensure that I look at it on my smartphone to make sure that the three or four sentences that I've constructed are above the page fold so that they can read it on their smartphone uh, fast scrolling because I know that they are not going to want to spend long uh, scrolling down. They just want to get to the point really quickly. And therein lies the, the kind of insight around mobile. You've got a much smaller screen to be able to convey a lot of information really quickly. I think also for many of us, the smartphone is the last thing we put down in the evening before we go to sleep and the first thing we pick up in the morning on waking and that's how pervasive things have become. So today I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about mobile is now the first touch point for our brands. It's not a message that many of the brand managers will particularly enjoy but it's one of those things that technology has moved on and shoppers in many ways are ahead of uh, ahead of the game. They've adopted the technology and we know um, research online purchase anywhere is a pervasive pattern and mobile is now the first touch point and I'll show you a few slides on that. I want to talk a little bit about how content is not optimized for mobile and the work that we've been doing with Cambridge to optimize our content for mobile and I want to show you the shopper first category solution that we've open sourced so that not only retailers can use it but also other brands and everybody can benefit. 
So just a couple of slides on the first touch point in everyone's pocket. So this is the front cover of Economist. It's actually really old. It's kind of, if you look carefully, it's March 2015. Uh, we're now about to hit March 2017. And even back then, they were declaring that by 2020, 80% of adults will have a supercomputer in their pocket, aka the smartphone. I uh, saw this tweet last week and I've added it to my deck because it shows that 430 million smartphones shipped in quarter four 2016, 1.5 billion uh, in total in 2016. Smartphone is still the next best thing. There's been a lot of noise. It's the Las Vegas Consumer Electronics Show about voice. And as much as I enjoy and find the Amazon Alexa really fun, I don't think a lot of stuff is getting sold through the Alexa and through voice yet. And actually, the opportunity for, for us to make e-commerce better on the smartphone is much bigger in the near term, and there's still a lot of work to do. Um, yes, so 6 billion smartphones by 2020 is the prediction. We're looking at 2.5 billion smartphones in use right now, according to Benedict Evans. So an, another little bit of stats, this is the Global Web Index survey of uh, 60,000 shoppers saying that already in 2016, 91% of adults own a smartphone. So the prediction that The Economist made is probably uh, quite prudent and underdoing it. Mobile is also the most important device, as you know, for most social media, so Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Obviously, Instagram is pretty much mobile only, but this, this uh, trend is pervasive. And I think the alarming thing is that the, the base of mobile-only shoppers is growing. So we're seeing in our emerging countries like China, India, uh, Kenya, South Africa, and many of our developing world markets that there's a lot of people who don't actually access the internet other than through a mobile. And rather than ignore these people and expect them to put up with a desktop-only design solution, we need to cater for them and think mobile first. This is a slide from Mary Meeker's State of the Internet presentation where she looked at screen minutes versus TV across many countries. I've only captured 10 or so here, but you can see the pattern is clear. People are spending more screen minutes looking at their mobile phone and their tablet than they are watching TV, and, and that's only accelerating. But I've heard a lot of people say to me, Ollie, mobile's not important because, you know, PC laptop still represents the majority of online shopping transactions. And I've heard that for probably two years now. And I would say that's not true anymore. So even criteria data but from quarter one, 2016, the mobile share of e-commerce transactions by country, and I'm not talking traffic here, I'm talking transactions, we passed the tipping point in many of the, the really big e-commerce uh, markets. Certainly China is now a bigger e-commerce market than the States. In Japan, you'd expect that, but even the UK, we're seeing a, a lot more uh, e-commerce transactions go through mobile than desktop PC. And I predict that USA is at tipping point now because I don't have the data for 2017, but I would predict that the USA is at tipping point right now. So I think we need, we all agree, we need to deliver a great experience for the online shopper. But probably what we haven't realized is we actually need to start with mobile rather than start with desktop. And we need to deliver a great experience on all screen sizes. So it's actually not just about mobile. We need to make sure that we optimize the experience no matter what device or screen size the shopper is on. So we need to start mobile first and then work towards the bigger screen size. Here's a great example, um, obviously 10, 15 years ago when the habit was to go to Blockbuster on a Friday night and actually pick up a DVD together with your Ben and Jerry's, I'd hope, being a Unilever man. Um, you, or the album, kind of the DVD cover would be quite ornate. It would have a lot of characters on it. It would be something that's designed for you to pick up and look at. Fast forward 15 years, and what's on Amazon, on iTunes, and on Netflix is quite different. And in fact, what's on Amazon, iTunes, and, and Netflix is very similar to mobile-ready e-commerce images. It's a distillation of what is the single most important uh, brand icon. Uh, from Finding Nemo, it's uh, quite effective, or Monsters, Inc. And then 
um, literally simplifying the design so everybody can actually see what's going on. So we need to create a better experience before the store in e-commerce. And the reason we need to do that is because shoppers are increasingly researching online before they go to a store. So their first experience is a digital one, and their first experience is a mobile one. And we did some very straightforward things. I noticed on our Ben & Jerry's vending machines that we had lids off our packs, and I thought, well, we could absolutely do that online as well. And we did, and we got strung up, strong up this, and I'll share that with you in a minute. You could do things in digital you just can't achieve in store. Obviously, in store, you wouldn't allow shoppers to rip the lids off Ben & Jerry's just to have a look at the ice cream and taste it. Um, unless you were giving away free samples, but online you can. So we need to design mobile first, and what does that mean? Well, firstly, let's talk about screen sizes. So here's a range of screen sizes all the way from the old iPhone 4S through to the um, exploding Galaxy Note 7. And the reality is right now is 80% of mobile traffic is still on screen smaller than five inches. So this presents an, a very big design challenge for us uh, as a branded manufacturer. You have a very, very small canvas in order to convey to the shopper what the essential pieces of information that they are looking for in fast vertical scroll. Because we all know that people fast vertical scroll because they've learned that behavior from Facebook, Instagram, and um, it, that behavior is pervasive. Just rewinding very quickly, I've been asked, do we really need better e-commerce primary images? I would say yes for two reasons. The first reason, I think I've outlined that clearly, was mobile is now the first screen. So not just Mary Mika is saying it or Benedict Evans is saying it, everybody's saying it now. Mobile is the first encounter that somebody's gonna have with a brand, it's gonna be digital first and mobile first. And the second I mentioned earlier was all about our eyesight. And uh, what happens when you turn 40, your eyes become uh, inelastic. The ability to focus near and far, your lens in your eye becomes a lot less flexible. So um, you either become long-sighted or short-sighted, or both, and you need very vocals. And ultimately, this makes it very difficult to multi-screen in the evening without glasses. And five million people in the UK, for instance, can't read newsprint without their glasses. But you'd be amazed at how many people don't bother to update their prescriptions, don't, don't bother to wear their glasses. So therefore, they're having a very suboptimal experience, to put it bluntly, when they're trying to shop off their mobile while they're multi-screening and watching TV in the evening. Also, I would say from the eye tracking that we've done, that online eye tracking shows a couple of significant things. The first is, when a shopper eye tracks down and scrolls the screen, and I can't mock that up all that easily on, on PowerPoint, but basically the eye um, has fixations and saccades, as I've shown you with the red dots. Shoppers like to look at the images. They avoid reading. And the reason they visually scan images is that our brain processes images 60,000 times faster than text, and it's a much easier thing to do to look through images than it is to read. And as a result, we've realized from eye tracking that most of what the retailer presents on their page is ignored and shoppers will avoid reading. So therefore, the important stuff needs to be next to the image or on the image because that's the only place that they're interested in looking at other than the ads basket button and the price. So what four things then do shoppers need to know to successfully choose the right product? I mean, it seems a sensible enough question, but it was one that Cambridge asked us when we started working with them. And it's elusively simple. Retailers will tell you price, and they're right. Price is correct, yes. But what else other than price do you need to see to choose the right product? Well, Cambridge has said, well, basically four things. The first is brand. People are looking for brands. They're looking for brands that they recognize. Magnum is the most valuable ice cream brand in the world. And it's distinctively recognizable with its big gold M on the dark brown chocolate background. And the hero image makes it very easy at every screen size imaginable to, see, to actually see what you're looking at and find the brand. Format, people are, if you look at the consumer decision tree in terms of how people shop and people shop deodorants and Unilever has very good market share in deodorants and we're experts in deodorants, people are very loyal to format. 
people who like aerosols don't generally like contact applicators like sticks and roll-ons. And so they are looking for their format when they go shopping. So people need to recognize, are they buying a Dove bar? Are they buying a Dove body wash? Are they not buying a Dove uh, bath cream? And they want to be able to work that out very easily from the hero image. Thirdly, variant. Shoppers shape by color and they shape they shop by shape. So yes, they recognize the shape of the Dove bottle, but they're also looking for the pink one. They won't necessarily know the name of the pink one. They'll probably call it the pomegranate one or the pink one. It's actually called Revive. But we want to make it really easy in the hero image for them to be able to see the pomegranate and recognize that this is, this is their variant. And then lastly, size. Um, it's very difficult when we use exactly the same bottle shapes across sizes as thumbnail to recognize which is the big one and which is the small one. And not, not a lot of shoppers want to have to go through to the product display page to verify w which one they're buying or read the text to see which size they're buying. So therefore we made it really easy for shoppers to see size in the bottom right hand corner. From all the eye tracking interviews that we've done, the most common mistake of people shopping online was actually people selecting the wrong size. I'm sure you find that true as well. So we created a video with Cambridge, which is available on YouTube. For purposes of time today, um, I'm not able to play it to you, but I would ask that if, if you'd like, after uh, the webinar, if you go to either Google or YouTube and type in mobile ready hero images, this video um, is now open source available for anybody to watch and demonstrates what it is like for the shopper to try and select from high speed vertical scrolling on mobile, what we call Vegas style scrolling, for lack of a better word, which is when the shopper stops the screen with their finger, a little bit like a slot machine will you kind of stop when you think you, you've hit the jackpot. So what I've done is built a little demo with Cambridge instead. So in this demo, I know you're not able to answer me, but I'd be asking you what is the brand. You may be able to recognize that was Dove. I'd then be asking you, is it what format is it? Is it shampoo, conditioner? And you were going to struggle because we use pretty much the same bottle shape for both, so you're not going to be able to answer me on that. And you're going to be forced to read, which will slow you down shopping, which will irritate you as a shopper. I'm then going to ask you which variant is it? Is it color care or intensive repair? And you're going to struggle because you're not going to remember. You're just going to say, oh, it's the pink one. I wanted the pink one. So you're not going to be able to tell that. And then lastly on size, is it the 400 mil, 250 mil, or the travel size? You're going to be stuck on that one as well. Now using exactly the same amount of space uh, with the hero image, and all we've done here is zoomed and we've added the off-pack lozenges. What is the brand becomes very simple. Is it shampoo or conditioner? Very simple. Intensive repair for or color care? Really easy to tell, and it's very easy to tell size. So there's just a quick demonstration of what medium zoom plus lozenges does. It really takes the shopper closer to the product and able to select it a lot easier. So what is a mobile ready hero image? I hear you ask. Well, Quite simply, it's, it's an image that's designed to work across all screen sizes. So it's designed to work uh, at the worst possible size, which is kind of anything between 10 millimeters, which is Tesco's uh, app, to 16 millimeters, which generally is probably around the biggest size you're going to get in a retailer's app, through to the biggest you're ever going to get, usually on a desktop, which would be about 48 millimeters, um, if you're lucky. And as you can see here, just because of medium zoom and the lozenges, it's much easier to be able to recognize that you're looking at Tresemme Shampoo 600 ml keratin smooth. And if I had to ask you to quickly give me that level of detail from the pack shot, certainly anything smaller than desktop, you're going to struggle. Um, the other thing is, because we know shoppers recognize their colors, we made it really easy to um, navigate by variant by having colors in the call-out strips. The dilemma that we face and, is, and the reason we use call out is because not all packs are square. Some packs are tall and thin, some packs are triangular, some packs are, are, are long in landscape. So here's a 
great example, and there are plenty of examples like this from toothbrushes to eyeliner, where I could say to you as brand owner, what brand am I looking at? We know that shoppers tend to type in category keywords into search. Yes, they do search for big brands like Dove and Nivea and Axe uh, links, but <clears throat> they will also search literally for eyeliner or deodorant. And if you're faced with this, it's very difficult to be able to tell what you're looking at. Who knows? Maybe it's Maybelline, maybe it's not. So what we've done, we have an eyeliner brand in India, which, as you can see, we've medium zoomed, and we've added the call-outs to actually make it very easy for the shopper to see what they're looking at. Finding your eyeliner shouldn't cause eye strain. So the work that we've done, we've, it's kind of three pillars. The first pillar is the visual science and getting to a greater visual acuity and helping particularly older shoppers with poor eyesight, helping shoppers who don't have access to desktop to, to shop, and using objectivity of the Department of Engineering and the Inclusive Design Unit at Cambridge University to be the expert to help us with that. And they've created a, a very simple open source test called the CIT Exclusion Model, and you can access it off their website. We also did a ton of research, both over 100 eye tracks using Toby Kit. Uh, we eye tracked on mobile, tablet, and desktop. And we did a big piece of quantitative research with SKIM and we tested 165 hero images across personal care against 35 pack shots, and, and without exception, hero images beat pack shots in terms of uplift. And lastly, to develop, um, I guess, category management for online, to understand what are the rules that should exist. We've taken feedback from GS1 and Google Shopping, which are open source there in the Merchant Center, all their uh, all their rules, and we've taken feedback from retailers. And, and the main thing that retailers told us, and I'm sure have told all of you, is they want visual consistency. They don't want Armageddon. Let's start with the first one. What is an inclusive design audit? Okay, so Cambridge make you wear these glasses, which feel like they've been smeared with Vaseline and you can't see. It simulates poor eyesight. But they also use something called the distance method, which is looking at a 23 millimeter image on a seven inch tablet from a meter away, can you recognize brand, format, variant, and size, okay? And the inclusive design standard that we set with Cambridge wasn't a particularly strict one. We said 75% of UK adults should be able to do it. And we weren't even testing on the, the difficulty of mobile. We're testing it, like I said, at a 23 millimeter image on a seven inch tablet. We wanna achieve 75% of inclusion adults can actually complete the task and quite easily work out those four things. When we look at the pack shot for Dove, you can see we've got real problems, particularly on formats and people recognizing it's a bar and certainly recognizing the pack count that there's six bars in this pack. Nobody was able to work that out, even um, from a 23 millimeter image on a tablet. So do hero images work? Absolutely, so this is some of the results that we've shared with retailers and quite openly shared to provide proof that the work that we've done does actually uh, drive mobile conversion on all screen sizes, both on mobile and desktop. In fact, unusually it drives even better conversion on desktop, um, which kind of shows that it, it, it works on both. And this is some of the quantitative, uh, qualitative uh, feedback that we got in terms of helping on brand clarity, clarity on formats, clarity on size, really unsurprising. And we've done A-B split tests with retailers. So for instance, adding the number of washes to indicate size in laundry, which PNG has followed us on, has, has delivered a, a simple 2.6% lift in an A-B split test that we did with the retailer. Um, on Ben and Jerry's, taking the lids off in a test with a retailer, simply that change, no change in price, got us a 3.6% lift. On Simple, um, we got an even better lift, and this is some of the tests, another test, the AB split test we did with the retailer. We got a, nearly a 20% lift in the AB split test. I think you'd be pretty cross uh, if you took the seven wipe home and you were meant to buy the 25 wipe. And then lastly, probably our most successful has been the work on Magnum to take the product out the pack so people can see what's inside. 
and basically show them the variancing a lot more clearly both on the pack and indicate um, as you can see what's in what's inside um, and this this has got us a 24% lift in an, in an AB split test with a, with a retailer in Europe. So hopefully that's convinced you there is some real conversion numbers behind mobile already here images, and they do work better than conventional pack shots. I think on to the next challenge is retailers wanted visual consistency because it's good for shoppers. It's good for brands ultimately to know what the rules are rather than creating visual Armageddon. And it's ultimately good for both shoppers and retailers, as I said. Here's kind of where we started out with uh, all I can say is really ugly yellow lozenges. This is never going to be a long-term solution because it's too attention-grabbing and your focus ends up being on the lozenge rather than on the pack. And it's just too noisy. And yeah, it's really, really ugly. Taking the front of pack number of wash ins lozenge, which is already established on the physical pack and laundry, and just lifting that off the image and putting it separately so shoppers can read it at 16 millimeters just made a whole lot more sense. So past efforts that, in a sense, delivered brand-led solutions uh, for mobile failed. We needed category solutions that would work across full categories. And the full category solution that we've open sourced is simply to say medium zoom and, and use the standard strip lozenges that Cambridge has created. Zoom really does work. So it's very difficult looking at these dove body washes to see what's going on. But when you have got medium zoom, it's quite quick and easy to see what you're looking at. We open sourced um, the template, uh, probably middle of last year, but I think it's June last year, and we made it available for everybody to download the Photoshop template, to download the Open Sans typeface, to download the laundry category lozenge that's uh, front of pack. And we waived our intellectual property rights for the template and for the number of washes lozenge because we realized we needed to create an industry standard and we've been working with GS1 to, to make this the industry standard. So we've been, GS1 hosted uh, two meetings, one hosted by Brand Bank on the 20th of January where uh, Cambridge trained on how to use the template. And last week, uh, GS1 hosted another meeting with 31 different suppliers in London, talking through any objections to this uh, template so that we could become the GS1 standard. And indeed, there were very few objections raised by the suppliers in the room, which was which is really good, and uh, this is moving to become the industry standard. In terms of just explaining the template, uh, it's very simple. Medium zoom does make best use of space, but it's not compulsory. It is compulsory to use the open sans typeface for off-pack text. The size call out should always match the color of the brand. The larger strip always matches the color of the format. Open sans should always be used in sentence case because it's faster to read it than caps. Uh, so, for instance, on the left, where you've got brand-led uh, solution, it leads to inconsistency across the category, whereas if you have the Cambridge GS1 endorsed lozenges, it leads to category consistency. And again, on colors, where uh, you have the wrong colors, it leads to a mess. Where you have the correct colors, it's much easier to be able to see what's going on. So just moving on to the decision tree for the position of off-pack communications. Ultimately, the brand team may choose whether or not whether they want to do mobile-ready images, whether they want to add off-pack communications, and whether they need it. But if they do add them, um, they need to follow the GS1 Cambridge rules. And th these are the rules so far that have been published openly. If your pack is squarish, then maximize the kind of this, the full canvas. So great examples of that are Dove, Andrex, as you can see, PG Tips, some, some, some very simple examples of how to do that. Second question is the formats obvious, the product type obvious from the pack. If it's yes, well then you only really need to talk about the size. And if you have an already established category standard lozenge, like we have in laundry, you don't need to use the uh, the other kind of uh, 
size lozenge in the corner, you can use the category standard lozenge. In many cases, there isn't a category standard lozenge. And in honesty, on mobile already here, images is not the opportunity to establish it. It has to be established usually on pack or on TV first before you have the right to use it on, um, on mobile. Because to try and establish it on mobile would be exceptionally difficult. The third question is, what is the aspect ratio of the pack? If the format's not obvious, therefore the longest strip needs to go along the bottom. And if the format is not obvious, but the, the pack is portrait, then the, the, it needs to go in a vertical strip on the right-hand side. And the reason the text reads from the bottom upwards is that's how a graph reads. So you know, all barcodes on pack also read from top to bottom. I mean, sorry, from bottom to top, so going up. Where have we got uh, mobile-ready images live? This is uh, public. You can go to any of these websites, and if you type in Dove or Ben and Jerry's, you will see our hero images across roughly 40 retailers and 20 markets. And we use Clavis to help us track whether hero images are live and what stage we are in terms of do we have the correct pack shot or do we have the correct hero image. We have come up with an elaborate scoring system, which the Clavis technology enabled us to do, which looks at exact match hero image for hero image, partial where we've got pack shots but not a hero image but the related pack shot, no match in terms of uh, we, we haven't even got the right pack shot live and we expect a hero image, where the hero image is missing in terms of our trusted source and there's no match, the hero image is, is missing but there is a match, and then there's no trusted source in our digital asset management system. Pretty complex, but I, I guess from my point of view, Clavis has been a great partner to be able to measure the complexity that we need in terms of, um, as, as Tom said earlier, across 20 markets or so, and with the granularity of seeing which part of the chain have things broken down. Is it the retailer's fault or is it our fault for not providing a correct trusted source? And I want to conclude with this. Um, we've seen this movement start. In our view, it's no longer a Unilever thing, but absolutely an industry thing. So our competitors are fast, have fast followed. Um, as an e-commerce team, we're delighted to have created the industry standard that competitors are now following. Um, we think ultimately it's shopper first, and uh, the, ultimately that's what you have to do to, to win the shopper over. You need to put the shopper first and then the retailer will align around that. So I'm gonna pause there because I know I've thrown a lot at you in the last 30 minutes and uh, hand back to Tom who's emceeing for us today. Thank you very much, Ollie. That, that was great. Some, some really interesting insights there and some really powerful actionable tips, I think, for the attendees. Uh, so we're going to move into the Q&A section of the program. There's been a, a good few questions in the Q&A box. I'm not sure we'll get through them all. Maybe I'll try and bring some of the questions together to, to try and answer more than, than we have time to do. Um, so you can enter your questions in the um, question box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and as you're writing your questions, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what Clavis Insight does. Um, so. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, so Clavis Insight is the leader in e-commerce intelligence globally. Um, you can kind of think of our solution as equivalent, the online equivalent of a, of a physical store audit. Our cloud-based technology automatically visits leading e-commerce retailers in your market, collects and analyzes all the information available about your products and your competitors' products in those retailers and then delivers daily updated actionable reports based on metrics such as portfolio, search placement, promotions, content integrity, et cetera, to give you um, a, a full understanding of how your products are represented in the online stores. Uh, we've got offices around the world, London, Boston, Paris, Shanghai, and Dublin, and uh, we're working with Unilever and, and similarly large organizations to help them drive online uh, and in-store sales uh, with a complete and reliable digital uh, intelligence system. Great. So, um, okay, let's, let's, let's move on to some of the questions. As I said, I think there's a few questions like I might try and bring together, uh, Ollie. Um, sure. They're, they're mostly, mostly for you. Um, so there's a question here that says that, you know, about retailers. There's a couple of questions about retailers. So one is that do you meet 
much resistance from retailers with respect to putting up these type of images that are not just straightforward pack shots. And there's another similar question, I guess, uh, that's kind of retailer focused and that, you know, looking at the, it looking great, at, uh, the question goes, looking great from a standpoint of the brand, but what happens when you are an e-tailer having stamps and over the images for promotions, et cetera, like two for one and half price, et cetera, coming into the info? How does that, is that one of the, <clears throat> one of the things that retailers, I guess, rebel against or, you know, is that, is that an issue yeah. to come across? Yeah, sure. So I'll deal with the first question, then I'll move on to the second question. So I understand your first question is, do I come across resistance from retailers to accept these uh, mobile ready here images instead of uh, pack shots? Absolutely. Um, I think it's a ma it's a major change in process. So retailers are used to uh, taking pack shots um, because we've always done it like that, and for suppliers then to provide an optimized mobile ready image is a change in process and um, I think what we've tried to do to alleviate the pain is uh, and because we, we we knew this would cause pain is to open source everything so that retailers could literally template and do it on their own label and also they could make it available for all suppliers down to the smallest supplier to follow um, I guess we've done the hard work for everybody and we don't begrudge doing that because we know it's the right thing to do for the shopper. And I think we've kind of eliminated the excuses that this is too hard because the brand bank, for instance, offers the service of, a, of being able to um, uh, create mobile ready hero images using the Cambridge template. And I know brand banks competitors in the States and Jessica will probably talk about this this afternoon later on in her webinar, offer exactly the same service. So the image providers or aggregators offer this service. Um, the second question um, was around retailers dropping kind of promo flashes across the hero images. Uh, our view is uh, a pretty strong one on that, is that our hero images are our brand trademarks. And retailers need to find other creative ways to highlight promotions. I think the need to highlight promotions is critical, and the need to highlight other things like days life, shelf life, is also critical. And uh, I've seen retailers like Sainsbury's being able to both highlight promotions and highlight days life or frozen or using other icons without covering up the hero image. In our view, we need to maximize the full canvas because our full canvas is only, 16, only a 16 millimeter square at best on mobile, and it's a 10 millimeter square on Tesco.com. So if we were to give up that space, we'd end up with a seven millimeter square, which is no good to anyone. And honestly, you can't design for something so small. So I think it's a matter of time for uh, that to be addressed in the mobile user experience where the promotional flashes don't impinge and go over the um, hero images. Great question. Thank you. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, there's another question here uh, about uh, who in the organization is responsible for this sort of thing. So um, the, the question is, do you have, uh, again, I'll put two questions together. So do you have hero images for all products uh, of your portfolio? and? Which function, uh, question mark, marketing, is responsible for the creation of the hero images? And again, the other question is similar is within the organization, who or what department is most resistant to the change and uh, how have you persuaded them to that this is the way to go or you know, that the hero images are, are better than what they might be offering? Um, so the first question was around, sorry, the first question was around who, who is responsible, was that right? Yeah, do you have images for, for all your products and, and who is yeah, responsible okay, for creating them so in your three questions. So do we have hair <laughs> images for all our products? Yes, we do. So if you go to Asda or Sainsbury's, you will see all the Unilever products have hair images. Who's responsible? In honesty, I'm not that comfortable with answering that because I think it's, it's up to you, your company to figure out who's going to do it, whether it's going to be sales or marketing. Go figure it out. Um, I'm not going to give that away. It's, it's not that difficult to figure out, to be honest. And then the last question, what was the last question, Tom? That resistance within the organization, have you come across resistance within your own organization and, and what sort of departments yeah, are so, there? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, I think 
um, it's something new, it's a change in process, there is going to be in some internal resistance. But actually, uh, what I, that's delighted me about working for Unilever is we've moved very fast, we've scaled very fast, and actually the resistance in many ways has been minimal in terms of, I think at the start there was a question around does this really work? And I think when the numbers came in, uh, we had very strong support and we've moved very quickly. Great, thanks. Uh, there's another question here about Apple Pay. Um, it says, does Apple Pay and other similar tools count as a mobile transaction? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll take that to be honest, I guess. Uh, but the thing about uh, these uh, mobile payment systems, I think these are some of the things that really encourage uh, the growth of mobile uh, sales. Uh, if you look at countries like South Korea and China where mobile payments are, are much bigger than they are would be in the UK or in Europe, there's also mobile e-commerce is, is a lot bigger, you know, 80% in South Korea and well over 50% in China. I don't know if you, if you have anything to add on mobile payments, Ollie, is that, you know, in consideration, are you still more focused on the content and the, and the images? Yeah, and I'm, more, I'm more the content expert rather than the payment guy. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, another question here about how applicable do you think these standards are to other categories outside grocery, like person, uh, and personal care and household, so which would the, you know, the Unilever's prime, primary candidates? Uh, categories. Do you think they're applicable in other categories as well? Um, yes, I do. I mean, I, I can't say they're applicable in every single non-Unilever category. That would be arrogant. I think um, I think what Cambridge has done definitely works for pretty much all of personal care, which is where Unilever is big and, and competes. Um, and we've done it in food, so a lot of the ambient food uh, products uh, you know, and all of Nor and Hellman's categories, we've done it for. Um, we've done it for our ice cream business as well, and those have got fantastic results. So, um, I know GS1 has kicked off the process to uh, make Mobile Ready Cambridge Here Images the de facto industry standard. They are uh, consulting with, as I mentioned earlier, in the UK with 31 different suppliers. Uh, they've had uh, hosted their first meeting. I'm sure that some, there may be some other new category standard lozenges that will emerge in non-Unilever categories, and that's great. Uh, but I'm also sh pretty convinced that people will use the Cambridge work uh, with similar CPG categories where they face the same issues in terms of tall, thin things are difficult to see and the off-pack lozenges work. I can see that work will be borrowed with pride and used. And that's great because we can fast track a better solution for the shopper. Great, thanks. And there's another question here. Are these images ADA compliant? And if not, are you getting pushback from retailers in the US? By ADA, do you mean the American Disability Association? I'm assuming. I guess, yes. I guess that I guess that's what they mean. <laughs> what, they're, what they mean, it, it, it's not explained here. <laughs> so yes, we are obviously we're working with inclusive design team from Cambridge, which is all about accessibility and inclusive design. Um, I won't go into detail other than say we have had strong retailer acceptance in the states. I think it's up to each individual company to work with retailers that are really strong on ADA-like targets. And I'm going to leave it there um, because ultimately I can't give away information that's not public. Great. That, that makes sense, Ollie. Okay. We've actually come to the end of our time allocated for this webinar. So um, I think there are a good few more questions. We'll try and answer them directly with uh, with some of the people as if we can. Um, but again, thank you very much, Ollie. That was really interesting, uh, and I hope um, our audience found it useful. So we're, we're going to end the webinar there now. Um, just to remind you all that uh, you will receive a link to a webinar recording as well as the PDF of the slides, so you, you'll get an email with all that information. We'll also uh, include a link to the video that Ollie pointed out in his presentation. Um, in that email, so that'll it'll take a couple of days to come through, but look out for that. 
Also, as you log out, there will be a, a survey will appear as you exit. Uh, please fill that in. Uh, we, you know, we'd like to find out how, how well we did or how badly we did, how we can improve these webinars as we go on. Um, we generally have these on a monthly basis, so, so look out for more coming up. Um, and yeah, so those who, people who fill out the webinar will be uh, sent a free copy of a, a Clavis white paper. So thank you very much, uh, and goodbye, everyone. Thanks, Tom. Goodbye, everybody.